Okay, much to everybody's relief, including me, this is my last lecture uh, for this uh, series. So what I want to talk about uh, for this lecture is the problem of what happens when we're looking at more than one uh, position in the genome. So we've been thinking about variation in evolution, mainly in terms of what happens at individual nucleotide sites or individual non-recombining bits of DNA. Uh, and uh, that's a, a very useful uh, first approximation for thinking about how things behave in populations. And it would be quite uh, completely valid if there were no associations between variants at different sites. Um, uh, that is to say, the genetic constitutions of uh, individuals uh, with respect to what happens at one place in the genome is completely independent of what was going on somewhere else in the genome. Um, and, in fact, much of uh, quantitative genetics uh, that um, Doug Joshi talked about on Sunday is built up basically by making this assumption that you can get away with summing up the effects of small effects of individual loci right across the whole genome um, and writing down equations for how the phenotypic mean and variance of a trait will change under that assumption. So it, it's, it's a very widely used assumption. But of course, it's not uh, completely valid. Um, and in fact, if we look in populations and we study uh, molecular variants like SNPs, uh, we do in find, fact find evidence for associations between variants at sites, especially sites which are closely linked genetically. And I'll define what I mean about that uh, fairly soon. So this raises three major questions. First of all, uh, we need to be able to describe associations uh, between variants at different sites. We can't do anything sensible unless we have a way of describing what we're talking about. Uh, then we need to be able to make models of evolutionary processes uh, that involve uh, our descriptors of the states of variants in populations. And then we want to ask, do they have important consequences for the outcome of evolution? And this is going to be the, 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 the way I'm presenting this lecture. Um, so let's talk about describing non-random associations uh, between variants at different sites. And I'll remind you that when we... Sorry about that. Thanks. I'm not quite sure why that happened, but it. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, so, what we get is a set of haplotypes. I, I've described those already, so I won't belabor the point here. It's basically just a list of the states of any variable nucleotide sites in the bit of genome that we're looking at. And here's another example of haplotypes. This time, it's the hemoglobin beta chain locus. I've blanked out some uh, bits of the sequence which are not interesting here. Here we have a, a set of different haplotypes. Only the, as before, only the variable sites are listed. You can see one haplotype here dominates the sample. Uh, 22 out of the haploids that were collected have the same sequence. We'll come back to why that is later in the talk. Uh, but as you can see, that's that's our list of haplotypes, and it, you can also see, just looking at this, that there tend to be associations uh, between variants at different sites. Um, but we'll, we'll have a look at how we describe those associations in a moment. This is what's called linkage disequilibrium, or LD. If you read uh, human genetics literature now, is full of papers where people uh, talk about LD without necessarily knowing what it is, uh, in the case of medical doctors. Um, uh, and that's a measure of the amount of non-random associations among the different sites. Um, 
And what we get is what's called the coefficient of linkage disequilibrium. It's not a very good term because it really doesn't have much to do with equilibrium, and it's uh, only uh, a little to do with linkage as well, but it's got stuck in the literature, so there we are. So I'm going to talk about LD. Um, and we're going to look at the simplest possible step up from one site. That's two sites. Um, so variant A1, A2 at the first place in the genome, called A, and B1 and B2 at the second site. So there's two variants at two sites. So how many combinations of variants at the two sites will there be? Four, thank you. So we actually have four haplotypes in this case. A1, B1, A1, B2, A2, B1, A2, B2. And we can write down frequencies. To distinguish them from allele frequencies, I'm going to write them down as Xs, X1, X2, X3, X4. How many independent frequencies do we have? Three, right, because frequencies add up to one. So we actually only have three independent variables here, three degrees of freedom in the system. But that's the primary description. We can also define frequencies of alleles, just as before. We've got the frequency of A1. That's the sum of these two haplotypes. Frequency of A2, the complement of that, is the sum of these two haplotypes. Frequency of B1 is the sum of these two frequencies. Frequency of B2 is the sum of these two frequencies. So we can reduce the system actually, to some extent, by looking at the allele frequencies that are too low. So remember, there's only one independent allele frequency at each locus. That means we've got two degrees of freedom associated with the two allele frequencies. For those of you who like to think in those terms, it's two pieces of independent information. Frequency of A1, frequency of B1, or frequency of A2 or B2, whichever you prefer to work with. That suggests there's one other piece of information which we need to give a full description of the state of the sample. It's not good enough just to use the two allele frequencies. We need something else. And that is our measure of non-random association between the variants at the two sites. And it's useful, first of all, to think about what the situation is if there aren't any uh, non-random associations. In other words, chance of a haplotype carrying a variant at site B is independent of its state at site A. And from elementary probability theory, you know that if you have two states which are independent of each other, the probability of two events at each of the two states is just the product of the frequencies of the events at each state. So the frequencies of the haplotypes in this case is very simple. It's given by the product of the frequencies of the alleles that the haplotypes contain. OK? That's important. That's the simplest case. No association. States of each side are independent. Frequencies of the haplotypes are given by the products of the respective allele frequencies. Uh, so this would be the formula here for x1, x2, x3, and x4. It, ignore the deltas for the moment if there were no associations. Now, in practice, there are departures from randomness. So there will be deviations, delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, and delta 4, from uh, those products, right? So there, if there's no random association, by definition, there will be departures from what you get if there are, it, it is no non-random association. So then those delta values have to be non-zero if then, in some sense, the states of the two loci are associated. Uh, I'm just going to skip briefly down this. Uh, just by using this argument here, you find that delta 1 is actually equal to minus delta 2. I'll, I'm not going to go through it. You can check the lecture notes later if you're interested, or you can check it for yourself. So delta 1 is equal to minus delta 2. You can do the same thing for all the other haplotypes. What we find, which is pretty obvious, there's a single variable that's sufficient to describe the departure from randomness of all the haplotypes. And that's what we call the coefficient of linkage equilibrium. That's equivalent to what I called delta 1 in the last slide. Remember, 
Delta I is the departure of A1, B1 uh, from its uh, random frequency. Sorry, it's you know, one more slide. So Delta I is our measure. Delta II is equal to minus Delta I. Delta III is equal to Delta II. And Delta IV is equal to Delta I. It turns out if you do the algebra. So in fact, fairly obvious this has to be the case. As I said already, there are three degrees in the system. Two of the degrees of freedom are used up by the allele frequencies. The last one, so there has to be something else. Everybody happy with that? And this is for how we can write the allele frequencies. This appears in every textbook in population genetics. Oh, should do at least. X1 is equal to PAPB plus D. X2 is equal to PAQB minus D. X3 is QAPB minus D. X4 is equal to QAQB plus D. So there's this nice symmetry here. The outer two have a plus. The inner two have a minus. Of course, we could describe it the other way around. It's quite arbitrary. Uh, what sign you attach to D. Uh, but if A1, B1, and A2, B2 are in excess, with this definition, D is positive. There are more of the A1 and A2 than you would expect uh, if they were combined randomly. If D is negative, then of course there's fewer of the A1 and B1 and A2, B2, and more of the uh, two inner ones. So it's, it's the completely general description of the state of this two allele, two local system. Okay. This is really advanced stuff. Uh, this was done first in 1918 by a man called Robbins. Um, so it's been around a long time. It's really nothing to do with genetics, in fact. This is the way you can describe any two variable system with two discrete states. So far, there's no genetics here. It's just boring old statistics. And we'll carry on with a bit of boring old statistics for a bit. Uh, you can find, by some simple algebra, that D is equal to x1, x4, minus x2, x3. Um, so it's the, what's called the difference between the cross product of the two gamete frequencies, x1 by x4, minus x2 by x3. And you can check that just by substituting this, the, the, the haplotype frequencies into that formula and cancelling a lot of terms. So that's what we think of as the primary descriptor of the amount of non-randomness in the system. But there's a problem. It's strongly dependent on the variant frequencies of the two sites. So obviously, if there's little frequencies of 0 or 1, D isn't necessarily undefined. And if the little frequencies are close to 0 or 1 at each site, the value of D is also constrained to be low. So people use other measures when they're describing their data. And you'll see these in lots and lots of papers. So I'll just run over them very quickly. One of these is called D prime. This was invented by Richard Lewontin uh, in 1964. Um, this is simply the ratio of D to the, its maximum absolute value uh, that it can take for the given allele frequencies. So D prime is defined as D over the maximum possible magnitude of linkage to equilibrium, taking the sign away. Uh, and a simple bit of manipulation gives us that D max is actually the smaller of these two if D is positive, and it's the smaller of these two if D is negative. Again, I'm not going to derive this. Uh, you can go away and scratch your head about this if you're interested. Um, so we have a nice measure here, which largely but not completely removes the dependence uh, on the allele frequency. So D prime is relatively, but not completely, independent of the allele frequency at the two loci. Okay? So that's, that's something which is used quite a lot. There's another method, which is in some ways more elegant, uh, which uses the fact that you can think of D as a kind of covariance between the states of the variance at each site. Um, you can see what this means if we define what are called indicator variables x and y for the two sites, such that x is 1 if a haplotype carries a1, and it's 0 if it carries a2. y is 1 if it carries b1, and it's 0 if it carries b2. So we can just arbitrarily define these two variables which denote the state of each of the two sites 
big X and big Y. Then we can measure the covariance between those two, and then we can translate that into a correlation coefficient, just as though you were dealing with any kind of, of uh, random variables, two random variables, X and Y. And it turns out, I'm going to omit the algebra, uh, that R is equal to big D over the square root of the product of all the allele frequencies. So that's a correlation coefficient. As you probably remember, correlation coefficients go between minus 1 and uh, plus 1, and they're 0 when the covariance, which is the term on the top, big D is the covariance. This is the product of the two standard deviations of x and y on the bottom. When d is 0, r is 0. When d is pretty big, r is plus 1. Or if it's very large and negative, it's minus 1. So again, it largely removes the dependence on the allele frequencies. So this correlation coefficient between the two loci, again, is something which you'll see quite often in the literature. Any questions there? So, yes? Sorry? It's plus one or minus one, yeah. yeah. Just like any other correlation coefficient. It's not, it's not obvious just looking at this formula, but... Mm -hmm. Well, I was saying nothing about what's going on. It's just a description. We go to the population, we collect the data, we get the haplotype frequencies. It says nothing about a process. This is just a description. So it's completely independent of what's driving the allele frequencies or the linkage to equilibrium. We'll come on to process in a moment. There's no genetics here. You could do this with anything, you, and people do two-by-two two tables, as they're called. I'm just coming on to that. So this is really what's called a two-by-two two table in statistics, where we have two variables, in this case B and A, each of which can take two states. So our data, in fact, if we went into a population, would consist of the numbers of each of these combinations, A1, B1, A1, B2, A2, B2, and so on. And the total number of observations is N. Um, so that's done all the time in elementary uh, statistics. Uh, and in fact, you can describe the departure from randomness by a chi-squared uh, follows a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom. Uh, the chi-squared corresponding to our uh, correlation coefficient is actually the number of observations times the square of the uh, correlation coefficient. And this is associated with a one degree of freedom because this is the chi-squared that measures the extent of departure from random expectation. Okay, so it just has one degree of freedom associated with this particular aspect of the data. Um, now, there's a problem with actually, so you can use uh, this to test for the significance of your linkage to equilibrium. You can ask, is there more linkage to equilibrium in my sample than I would expect if I just chose a random sample from the population in which there was no association in the population? That's obviously important to do. We go out and collect data. We really want to know whether or not uh, the linkage to equilibrium that we estimate is, is just real, or is it just a product of the random sampling of that small number of haplotypes that we've taken from the population. Okay. So people, again, use this chi-squared test all the time. Now, uh, those of you who know a bit of statistics will realize that if we have a two-by-two two table in which the expected numbers of these are quite small, then chi-squared distribution um, breaks down. Fortunately, Professor Fisher, again, came up with something called Fisher's exact test, which is basically just using combinatorial theory to calculate the probability that you get the con each possible configuration of the two-by-two two table on the assumption of uh, random association, and then you can uh, use Fisher's exact test asked whether your departure is random, is significant or not. Any good computer program these days which investigates LD will probably use Fisher's exact test rather than the chi-squared. So we can ask, therefore, whether or not what we see in our sample indicates that in the population there really is significant linkage to equilibrium. 
rather than just the amount of LD we see in the sample being a product of random chance uh, from a situation where, in reality, there is no LD. So I wouldn't be talking about this, really, if there wasn't actually uh, experimental evidence uh, for uh, such a phenomenon. So I'm giving you an example from a former postdoc of Deborah's, Asha Kata, who worked on the Cenorhabditis romanii, which is this outcrossing species of nematode worm. It has two sexes. Um, and he, he looked at six genes. So th this is the data from six genes. And he calculated the R squared. You can't see it very well, but that's what the Y axis actually is, as a function of the separation between each pair of sites that was variable in his gene. So he has A1, he has A and B at various different sites, and he's summing up over all possible pairs of sites in the gene. So there's a huge amount of data if you have a large number of segregating sites, because you've got N, N minus 1 over 2 possible pairwise comparisons. So that's why you see a large cloud of points here. Of course, they're not exactly independent of each other at each point. Um, and what you can see is the data is extremely noisy because these are based on quite small samples from the population. But when you fit a curve, this is sites which are right on top of each other, only one nucleotide or so away, sites which are 100 nucleotides away from each other, sites which are 200, and so on. You can see, if you fit a curve with the eye of faith, uh, you can see a decline in the LD with distance apart. It doesn't go completely to zero, because, of course, there's a sampling problem. Even if there were no LD in the population, the squared value of the correlation coefficient will be non-zero uh, because of the random sampling. So don't be shocked by the fact that the LD doesn't go all the way down to zero. But it's falling off pretty fast. This is probably the best data set here, where the curve looks most convincing. So when you do this kind of thing, this has been done over and over and over again. Now, they're massive, massive data sets, particularly on human populations because you turn at you for working on humans, not so much for working on worms, um, uh, you get this kind of pattern. That LD is very strong for sites which are very close to each other in the genome. It's not very strong for sites which are some distance away. There are curves which are fitted. Now, if you ask me how the curves are fitted, I can't remember. You'd have to go to the original paper. But they're, in some sense, the best-fitting curve, statistically. I presume it's a, some kind of quadratic or cubic regression. I, I can't remember, to be honest. OK, so that's what the data looks like. Basically, after a lot of work, uh, in the early days using electrophoresis, actually, I did this for my postdoc. You had about 30 loci. They're all scattered all over the genome don't find any LD. It's really boring. When you get down to the DNA sequence level, when you look at sites which are sufficiently close to e each other on the chromosome, and what I mean by sufficiently close depends very much on the organism, as we'll see in a moment, um, you, you, you see a lot of LD. Right, what's generating LD? Now we have to talk about recombination. Uh, um, right, I'll just go to the board for a minute. Um, so those of you who are biologists, this will all be familiar. This is what I call sex education for physicists. Um, this is the basic process of sexual reproduction in eukaryotes. And this kind of motor reproduction is actually basal for eukaryotes. So we have, I'm describing here a, a simple organism, say, like yeast or chlamydomonas, which is haploid. So we have the two gametes. I'm only drawing one chromosome. They come together. Little dots here are the centromeres, where the chromosome attaches to the spindle fiber. So here's our diploid zygote. We've got a maternal and a paternal chromosome. Now, in an organism like yeast or chlamydomonas, uh, you often have a rather brief zygote phase, followed by meiosis, where you have a special cell division. The two chromosomes divide the maternal and the paternal one. Then they associate and usually undergo a process of crossing over where there's a break and rejoining. So I've driven, drawn one of these as a squiggly line here. 
So this squiggly line joins up to this one. This squiggly line joins up here. Then, what, so you end up with a chromosome which looks like this. It's got a piece of this one line joined into that chromosome, a piece of that one joined into that. These ones have remained the same. Then you go through one cell division in which these two chromosomes go to opposite poles. So you get the two products of the first division of meiosis. Then you have the second division of meiosis, and you end up with one non-crossover chromosome here with, say, the maternal genome. Here's the paternal genome intact, and here are two gametes which are complementary and have a reshuffling of maternal and paternal genomes. And that's what sex is all about, basically. It's the same all the way from Chlamydomonas up to humans. Uh, the sort of mechanics of how you get the gametes together, of course, varies greatly among different organisms. But for a geneticist, that's of no interest whatsoever. Um, Hollywood movies and so on think rather differently. Um, but all we're concerned about is fusion, crossing over, and the production of gametes. So genetically, what you can get, I'm forgetting about the four here, I'm just stripping it down to two, is if we have two different gametes, uh, here's uh, the oopsie, maternal and paternal uh, gametes. If they differ at two loci, this is our paternal geno genotype, here's our maternal genotype. Then there's a certain probability that you get a crossover between them, which is, I'm going to write the C, so you end up with this reshuffling, and here you have the two parental types with probability 1 minus C. So C is what we call the frequency of crossing over or the frequency of recombination. That's the probability that you get a break and exchange between the, the sites of these two uh, markers which we're using. If those two uh, loci were not heterozygous, we'd have no genetic signature of the recombination event. So I'm going to use C as the probability of an event that occurs of this kind between the two sites we're looking at. Okay. Now, uh, the only situation where crossing over makes any difference is if you're heterozygous at both loci. You're what's called a double heterozygote. And as I've just shown you, if it's A1, B1 over A2, B2, these are the frequencies of the four possible gametes after uh, among the gametes produced by that uh, set of individuals. So if we take a half, large number of A1, B1 over A2, B2 individuals, and we measure the frequencies uh, of uh, these various combinations among the progeny of those individuals, and that's what geneticists actually do, uh, you would see these frequencies of those gametes. You could do the complementary experiment you could have uh, A1, B2 over A2, B1, and you get the complementary result. Here are the two uh, non-crossover types in this case, and here are the two crossover types. So there are two types of double heterozygote here. You can Logically, you can have A1, B1 over A2, B2, or you could have A1, B2 over A2, B1. And they're the only genotypes in which crossing over recombination makes any difference. Okay? Everybody happy with that? that? That's all we need, really. And that's what sexual reproduction is all about. It's generating these recombinants. Uh, Lindy said yesterday that having dealing with asexual organisms is not easy. I'd like to point out that genetics would not exist as a science if we didn't have sexual reproduction. You can't do genetics unless you have sex. So if Mendel had tried to work on bacteria, he would have been a hopeless failure. It took people 50 years, basically, after the rediscovery of Mendel to actually get into the genetics of bacteria. It's really hard stuff to do. So all we need to know is what happens in the double heterozygotes. And we can go through some manipulations. And if we look at A1, B1 over A2, B2, contribution of gametes to the population from this genotype, well, its frequency is, in fact, 2X1, X4. It's just like Hardy-Weinberg. Uh, we, it's like 2PQ. It's just we're using the two gamete frequencies instead of allele frequencies. Um, 
and this is what we the contribution of that type to the population will be, taking into account its frequencies. And what you can see is the recombination or crossing over is reducing the frequencies of A2, B2, and A1, B1 by C times X1, X4. That's the probability uh, that you have a crossover multiplied by half the frequency of that genotype. The other one, complementary ones, are increased by the same amount, because the flow is going backwards and forwards between them. So recombination reduces gamete frequencies uh, and increases gamete frequencies uh, in proportion to the frequency of crossing over and the frequency of that particular double heterozygote. And you can do the same for this double heterozygote, the other one. That has frequencies 2x2, x3. You get the same result. These two go down and these two go up. So it has opposite effects in the two different types of, game, of double heterozygote. And when you put this all together, pretty straightforward algebra, you get the following result, that in the next generation, the frequency of A1B1 is given by this very simple expression here. Frequency of A2B2 is given by this one, and so on. So we get... Uh, for a situation in which nothing is going on except recombination, I should have said this, we're not considering any other evolutionary force, just recombination in a large random mating population. Those are the basic equations for the changes in haplotype frequency. I, I've skipped through the details here. Uh, they're in the lecture notes. You can bone up on them later if you're interested. But this is the bottom line. And we can make this even simpler because we know that D, big D, is X1, X4 minus X2, X3. So we end up with this remarkably elegant set of equations. X1 prime is equal to X1 minus CD. X2 prime is this. X3 prime is that. And X4 is that. So we reduce the whole thing down to a very simple set of equations. And of course, there's only three of these equations that are independent of each other. So that's the final result. That's all assumption that there's nothing going on except recombination. Okay. Don't worry too much about the, the derivation here. This is the bottom line that's important. Now we can go a step further. We can ask, what's the recursion relationship for big D itself? We don't care about the gamete frequencies. We know from Harley-Weinberg that under this model, the, ga the allele frequencies, excuse me, we don't care about the allele frequencies because we know that under Hardy-Weinberg, the allele frequencies are constant. And recombination is not going to do anything to the allele frequencies. It only affects the, the combinations of alleles. So we can then get a recursion relation for, for big D. And that, again, is some very, very simple algebra, which I'm not going to go through. Um, the value of D in generation T is equal to 1 minus C times its value in T minus 1. So we've now got as far as two locus theory circa 1918. And if we go back down many generations, d sub t is equal to 1 minus c to the power t times d sub 0. So d declines approximately exponentially. That means that sooner or later, it's going to be arbitrarily close to 0. Okay, So recombination is continually breaking down this non-random association. That's the intuitive way of thinking about it, we have this process of crossing over going on. It's continually breaking down every generation, any non-random association, and it gets smaller and smaller, the level of non-random association, till it dies away to nothing. So if nothing is going on in the population, there's a sort of two-state equivalent of Hardy-Weinberg, and you can generalize it to three, or n loci. I'm not going to do that. It's really boring. Um, uh, you can, the, the final state is no associations between any of the sites in the genome. And it's fairly obvious, too, that the larger the frequency of recombination, the bigger this term, the faster this, this, this goes. Now, since the variant frequencies don't change, the same result applies for D prime and R. So we can, we can say that all measures of linkage to equilibrium will decay to nothing uh, at a speed which is given by 1 minus the recombination factor. 
So in an infinite, this is the bottom line here, in an infinitely large, randomly mating population with no other evolutionary forces acting, recombination eventually creates random combinations of variants of different types. And with close linkage, it may take a long time, of course, to get to that state. Since the time scale over which this happens is, if C is small, is roughly one over C generations is what you, is the time it takes to really do something to linkage to seek delivery. Okay? So we now have a prediction. There should be no linkage to equilibrium, right? Everybody agree? But what do we see? LD, yes. Reminds me of one of those sort of football chants, LD. <laughs> so there is LD. So where is it coming from? Well, there are various possibilities. We've assumed a random, closed, random mating population. So one possibility is populations are mixing and that they have originally genetically different from each other. So if we have two populations that have been, so now I'm getting onto what's causing the LD that we see in populations. That's the question I'm addressing. So let's look at this first possibility, which is actually quite an important cause of LD in human populations. Um, so we have two populations. They've been isolated from each other for a long time. Uh, they may diverge because of selection or genetic drift. And there may be little or no LD within each population, but they differ in variant frequencies. And if the populations start to interbreed, this will create LD, and I'm just going to draw a cartoon of this. This is an extreme situation. One po population is fixed for, a, for A1, B1. Another population is fixed for A2, B2. They come together. The first generation, you've got A1, B1, and A2, B2, right? It's got complete linkage to the equilibrium, the total association between the two variants. And then recombination will get to work. Uh, and start to break down that linkage to equilibrium if nothing else is going on. But that may take a long time if the variants are reasonably close together in the population. And there's obvious applications, for example, to, to human populations, which until quite recently, different parts of the world, like India and Britain, were very isolated from each other. But now people are moving across, and people being what they are, they're intermarrying, and you're getting breakdown of associations. So you might have people with dark skin color and blue eyes, because of the recombination between the genes which are controlling those kind of traits. And that's what goes on. So that's a source of important source of linkage to equilibrium in many populations. And there are natural examples of this too. Uh, the things like hybrid zones. Um, where populations of animals have been isolated to it from each other, for example, by glaciation. They come together in a wide uh, front when the two populations get together across North and South in Europe. This happens quite commonly. Uh, and so you get a lot of linkage to equilibrium in the area where the two populations are starting to merge. So that's a source of LD. There are other sources. Genetic drift is another one. Uh, it can also cause frequencies of haplotypes to depart from expectation because you can think about the four haplotype frequencies as though there are allele frequencies at a single locus, in a sense. So genetic drift can shake those around just in the same way that it shakes allele frequencies around. So it can shake the uh, haplotype frequencies around in such a way that LD is created. Uh, and this is a, a one of the harder problems in theoretical population genetics is to predict roughly how much LD you might expect uh, purely from the action of genetic drift. But intuitively, it's fairly easy to see that this will happen. Everybody getting hot, aren't they? Oh, no, thanks. Right. So let's have a look at the results. I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, go into the uh, details of the um, derivation here. It, I would probably get it all wrong. And it, in any case, it would take the rest of the day. So let's have a look at the bottom line. Uh, this was basically done by Kimura and Ota 
uh, a long time ago using diffusion theory and re-derived by Gil McPhee using coalescence theory. We're going to make the infinite sites assumption that we've talked about before. So there's variability at each of these two loci maintained by drift and mutation. They're neutral. Um, and what Ota and Kimura did was to take the average value of d squared over the process of drift because we're trying to get rid of the sign here. We don't really care whether it's negative or positive. We're just trying to get an estimate of its magnitude. So they calculated the ratio of the mean of d squared to the mean of the product of those variant frequencies at the pairs of sites. That's something called sigma squared little d in the jargon. And it's more or less the same as the expectation of the squared correlation coefficient. It's not quite the same, but it's nearly the same. So for simplicity, we can think that we're we can pretend that we're calculating the average value over the entire drift process of the square of the correlation coefficient. And here's, the, in other words, what we're doing in, in reality is calculating the expectation of d squared, the mean of d squared over the whole process, divided by the mean of the cross product of the allele frequencies at each site. And that's not a trivial problem. So it's really a very hard problem to calculate that. Uh, and I certainly would never have been able to do it in a thousand years. But Ota and Kimura are pretty smart people. And they came up with this nice formula. Uh, it looks a little odd. Uh, there's some strange things in it, but it's, it's right. Uh, the basic parameter here is what's called the scaled recombination rate. Remember theta? That's the scaled mutation rate, 4ne times mu. It's a sort of magic. It's what's called the scaled recombination rate. Remember theta? That's the scaled mutation rate, 4ne times mu. It's a sort of magic property of finite populations that things pop out being multiplied by 4ne. It's, it's part of the sort of structure of the universe or something. Um, so 4ne times the recombination rate or rate of crossing over is our measure of recombination here. Uh, and we have this result, 10 plus rho over 22 plus 13 rho plus rho squared. Uh, you don't have to memorize this formula. I can't remember it. But you can always look it up. Um, these days, of course, you don't have to remember anything. You just go to your smartphone and type in to Google and bingo. Hello? Sorry. OK. My slides have the answer to everybody's questions if you wait long. <laughs> OK, so we can get small, some good approximations. If rho is quite big, in other words, if 4NEC, let me just write down the definition of rho on the board. Uh, so 4 times the effective size times the recombination rate is our scaled uh, measure of recombination. If this quantity is rather big, say 10, then this is a very good approximation. It's just 1 over rho. Uh, and you often see that one in the literature. Uh, people who, uh, other textbooks often say, this, this is the formula for the amount of linkage to equilibrium. But it's not exact. If rho is very small, uh, if there's almost no recombination, then actually this approach is 0.45. So, this makes some uh, predictions that are actually quite useful for interpreting data on molecular variation. Extent of LD depends on recombination frequency and effective population size, okay, or NEC. So you get more LD for a given recombination rate in small relative to large populations. Okay, so that's one prediction, yeah? Uh, no, actually, it comes to 0.45. It, do, it doesn't blow up. That's a, a bit of a, 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 an artifact of using sigma squared d. But so more LD for a given recombination rate. So in humans, with an NE of about 2 times 10 to the 4, uh, we expect much more LD than in Drosophila, where any, if you do the same calculation that I did for humans, the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, any comes out about a million. And the same is true for many species of plants that have been looked at. So we've got any a million rather than 20,000. Also, we predict a strong decline in LD with distance, which is what we saw already in the slide. So let's see how that stacks up. 
it turns out very conveniently uh, for us the average frequency of recombination between two adjacent nucleotides uh, sorry there's a surplus nucleotide in there it's nucleotides not nucleotide nucleotides sorry about that it's about 10 to the minus 8 per generation actually it's about the same as the mutation rate so that's a probability per generation that you get a recombination event between two adjacent nucleotides but it's small um, so where any of 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 4, in both cases we get a sigma squared d value of about 0 0.43, 0 0.45. It's not going to be very different for humans and flies. If we go one kilobase apart, 1,000 bases away, then uh, for fruit flies, the expected measure of LD goes way down to an undetectable level. Humans, it's still quite detectable. If we go 10 kilobases apart, it gets totally negligible for flies and very small for humans. So that's giving us some measure of how fast we expect LD to fall off. And in fact, if we look at fruit fly populations, they're a good, uh, healthy organism. Uh, they actually agree quite well with the predictions. But humans don't. OK, so the theory is great for the fruit flies, but it's rubbish for humans. And what you get in humans is things called haplotype blocks where there's basically, a, over all pairs of sites within that region of the chromosome, you see complete linkage to equilibrium. I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. Um, well, why don't I show you some pictures of it right now? This, so that's what you see in Drosophila or C. Romanii. This is what you see in humans. This is D prime uh, in these several different bits of the human genome. Uh, 10 kilobases, 40 kilobases, 100 kilobases, really appalling reproduction here. Uh, this is from a paper in Nature by David Reich's group in 2001. And what you see is D prime is staying right up to 100 kb away. And here it's 40 kb away. Here it's 100 kb away. So there's complete linkage to equilibrium over 100 kilobases. That's very different from what we see in flies, and it's very different from what the theory predicts. They've tuned up the theory a bit. These are the dotted lines, and that's the prediction of an improved version of the theory. So in most cases, here, here's not too bad agreement, but in most cases, uh, the theory is pretty bad. So we've got much more LD than we expect. Why is that? Well, one possible cause is humans, uh, especially European and Asian populations of humans, during the movement out of Africa, have gone through bottlenecks of population size followed by expansion. And if you do computer simulations, this can create extensive LD. And so uh, the prediction there is if we go to African populations, which have not uh, gone through such extensive bottlenecks because they have the sense to stay in the same place rather than move around the globe, uh, you, in fact, should see smaller LD blocks. You do, but you've still got LD blocks in Africa. So there's something else going on. And this is actually one of the most exciting discoveries uh, uh, in recent times about what's going on in genomes. It's something called recombination hotspot. Turns out in many organisms, including humans, recombination is not distributed evenly over the genome. Our probability of a crossover is not uniform along the chromosome. Instead, there's certain regions of the genome we have a really high chance of having a crossover. And there are other regions of the genome uh, where there's almost no chance of getting a crossover. And in fact, uh, about 80% of recombination events in humans are, are, bring us, are thought to be associated with um, small regions. These small regions may be about two kilobases of DNA each. And there's several thousand of these regions in the human genome, and that's where most of our recombination is going on. And clearly, if, if you're in a region where there ain't no recombination, LD is going to persist. And that's one major explanation for these LD blocks. I haven't got time to go into all the evidence of this, but it'll be another couple of hours. And in fact, you can turn this upside down. And this is mostly the work of people like Gil McBean, who was my postdoc at one time, and Simon Myers, working in Oxford, and then Susan Tuck and people working in Germany. Um, 
you can turn this upside down. You can use the population genetics theory, much more sophisticated than I've presented to you, to estimate recombination rates of individual points in the genome and identify the locations of hotspots. And hotspots have been identified also uh, by clever experiments by people like Alec Jeffries, where they measured recombination rates in large numbers of sperm. Uh, and you can so you can check for identification of hotspots by the the um, population genetics methods, and so far it all agrees pretty well. This has greatly annoyed Alec Jeffries. Um, so uh, you can go further. You can ask if you got all these positions in the human genome where you've got these hotspots, can we find something which is characteristic of those hotspots? And yes, you can. You can identify a 13 base pair motif. Obviously, it's not completely conserved in every place, but it has a commonality, and I can't remember exactly what that is. You know, it's G's, C's, A's, and T's. Um, so it was discovered by Myers and McBean uh, that there's this place in the genome associated with hotspots and as a common core of 13 bases. And then Simon Myers had the bright idea that this might be recognized by a, a DNA binding protein, and he spent a lot of time going through data on DNA binding, and he discovered a, a protein called PRDM9, which recognizes this motif. Um, and that is, in fact, what is actually causing recombination at these hotspots. And this was uh, independently discovered by a group of French geneticists working in mice. You have not quite the same motif, but you've got the same protein recognizing these hotspots in the mouse genome uh, and causing the recombination events. So there's a nice uh, example here. Of you can actually use population genetics to discover something which is of interest to real geneticists. Most of the time, what we do makes real geneticists fall over dead or uh, at least asleep. But in this case, uh, it, it, you know, they hit gold. Sorry? It is, yes, yes. But it's not universal in mammals. Um, dogs do not have PRMD9, and they don't have the motif. But they have hotspots. They're diff completely differently organized. They, well, it's very difficult with dogs because they're so bloody domesticated and inbred. Um, <laughs> okay, so that's, that's what you can do uh, with genetic drift and neutral markers and LD. I, I'll talk very briefly about selection. What happens if we have selection? Obvious cause of LD is not genetic drift, but natural selection acting on the two variants. This was actually an, another discovery by Fisher in 1930. He was the first person to point out that if you have a two-locus system, uh, things could be funny. Let's look at how you can represent fitness in a two-locus system. Uh, I'm going to assume that we have one where there's polymorphism at each of the two sites. Otherwise, there's nothing to discuss. Uh, and so let's assume there's good old heterozygous advantage. So this is the best genotype. Uh, here's the fitnesses of A1, A1, and A2, A2 on a B1, B2 background. Here's the fitnesses of A1, A2, and A2, A2 on a... Uh, sorry, B1, B1, and B2, B2 on an A1, A2 background. So here we have heterozygous advantage. You can ask, then, what are the fitnesses of the other genotypes in the system? Well, the simplest assumption is additive effects. That's what we call no epistasis. Epistasis is, uh, I think I can scrub this now. There's a genetic jargon for interaction. So if we're measuring things on a linear scale, which is what I'm going to do here, when there's no epistasis, we can predict the fitnesses of the other genotypes just by adding the effects of each of the two loci independently. So, for example, B1, B1, A1, A1 has its fitness reduced by SA and SB, which is adding the effects of the two uh, loci on their own. 
So that is a, what we might call an additive fitness matrix with no um, uh, epistasis. Okay? So that's the simplest possible situation. Um, and in fact, this will guarantee stable polymorphic equilibria at each locus. And the equilibrium frequencies of the two alleles, A1 versus A2 and B1 versus B2, are exactly the same as I gave you in my lecture. The two loci are not talking to each other at all. There's no linkage to equilibrium at that equilibrium. Uh, now, let's suppose fitness is combined multiplicatively. You heard yesterday from Mike Whitlock that multiplicative fitnesses are independent. This, of course, is completely wrong. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's biologically uh, independent. The probabilities of survival at the two loci are acting independently of each other. But as far as the additive scale, uh, there are deviations from additivity. So fitness under a multiplicative model is 1 minus SA, 1 minus SB. Right? We're multiplying the fitnesses of the two genotypes here together to get the fitness of the double homozygote. So here are the two single homozygotes. This is the double homozygote. But its fitness is actually uh, altered a little bit uh, by the amount SASB. If we multiply this out, there's the blackboard again. Let's take our multiplicative expression, 1 minus SA, 1 minus SB. This is equal to 1 minus SA minus SB. And then we have plus SA, SB. So it's a little bit bigger than the additive model predicts, right? That's just simple algebra. So you might think of this as being the natural example of no interaction between the two loci, and that's fine from the biological point of view, but from the sort of statistical point of view, it's an interaction. We're actually not completely linear here. Now, the difference is not very big if SA and SB are small, but it gets bigger and bigger the bigger SA and SB. Okay? And we can do that for all the other core corner genotypes here. So we actually have four little measures of epistasis. Uh, these are often called the epistasis coefficients. In general, we don't have a multiplicative model. Uh, we have, can have an additive model with arbitrary epistasis coefficients. Everybody happy with that? Now, we can then go on and analyze the dynamics of two locus system. We have three independent variables we have to consider. That's not that easy, actually. Uh, the dynamics are nonlinear, and it's actually quite hard to get explicit mathematical solutions for the polymorphic equilibria, which will be generated and, and analyze their properties. There's a whole school of population genetics, geneticists based in Stanford, Mark Feldman and Sam Carlin, who have devoted years of toil to solving this problem. Um, and I don't want to get into the details. Uh, there are some general conclusions, and I'll just run over those briefly. Uh, so I'm going to give you the bottom line on many, many years of uh, arduous work uh, solving really boring sets of equations. Um, if there's no epistasis, the only possible polymorphic e two locus equilibria have no linkage to equilibrium. In other words, you only get, uh, you end up with no association between the two loci. So that's with additive fitnesses. That's mentioned that already. It's pretty obvious intuitively. However, uh, in more general, if you have what's called epistatic selection, you get d greater than zero only if c is above some critical value. So you have to have sufficiently tight linkage to get non-zero uh, values of d. I should say that should be d with an absolute sign. Uh, and so more generally, you only get appreciable amounts of linkage to equilibrium if c is a similar size or less than the strength of epistasis. So you have to have sufficiently strong epistatic selection in relation to the amount of recombination to get LD. And the intuitive reason for that, of course, is that recombination is continually breaking down associations. So it's these interactions between the two loci which are giving you the favorable combinations of alleles at each locus, which work in the opposite direction. 
And so the, really the very, very bottom, bottom line is that unless less are really quite closely linked or selection is extremely strong, you don't expect to see uh, much measurable LD created by selection. So, given that most LD at the DNA sequence level is between silent sites, it's not terribly likely that epistatic selection is involved. Uh, so, I would, I would assert that most of the LD that we see in the genome has nothing to do with this kind of selection. There are a few examples uh, where we're looking at conspicuous visible phenotypes, and there seems to be close linkage, uh, and linkage to equilibrium maintained by selection. So, it's the peer is an example. This shell color and shell band number that I mentioned involve two loci. They have a recombination frequency, which is less than 2%, so they're really quite tightly linked. Um, brown shells are nearly always unbanded, probably because uh, they confer protection against bird predators on a background of earth or falling leaves. You just want to be brown. You don't want to have a big chocolate stripe in the middle of your shell. It makes you less conspicuous. Yellow shells are frequently banded because they pro convey protection in, say, grass, uh, where you have shading, uh, light and shade, and a broken pattern is well known to be less conspicuous in that kind of environment. So this is classic work by Kane and Shepard back in the 1950s. So that's an example where... Yes? They do. They do match their background, yeah. And here, here are the snails again on Deborah's hand. Uh, they're, not, they're not selected to be uh, hidden against human hands. So, so here, here is the brown unbanded form. Rather irritatingly, there are quite a lot of banded yellow ones here. We, we should have killed those off. <laughs> OK. An interesting point, this is why Fisher was interested in this question, is if you have epistatic selection of this kind, so you're basically creating linkage to equilibrium. So you could say that A1, B1, A2, B2 are good. A1, B2, and A2, B1, in some sense, are bad um, combinations. Uh, this will select for reducing the frequency of recombination. Um, and uh, because if you reduce the frequency of recombination, you create more of the good combinations and fewer of the bad ones. And, of course, the most extreme type of situation where you could modify the recombination rate between the two loci is a chromosome inversion, because in heterozygotes for a chromosome, uh, you crossing a, uh, for an inversion, you, you suppress crossing over. And that may explain why you see so much inversion polymorphisms. And there are actually some examples uh, in Drosophila and mice, where we know for sure what the selective epistatic mechanism is. These actually involve a rather unusual form of selection, which involves severely distorted segregation. I haven't got time to go into that. It be another lecture in itself. So there's some examples of epistatic polymorphisms, and there's some examples where we're pretty sure we know why a suppression of recombination uh, has evolved. So I want to get on to the last part of the lecture, which is to sort of ask the question of, is there any evidence that recombination is actually a good thing in the sense that it affects patterns of variability in a positive way in the genome? So this is the sort of third last part of the talk. Um, and let's first of all look at a situation where Recombination involves the effect of selection at a given site in the genome uh, on variability at closely linked sites where basically uh, one site might be under strong selection and the other sites are not so weakly selected, they're either neutral, uh, not so strongly selected, they're either neutral or weakly selected. And this is actually a lot of important consequences for our understanding of the evolutionary significance of sex. Deborah showed you yesterday that being asexual is actually a jolly good thing. You can spread rapidly through the population and wipe out the sexuals. But as I've said, sexuality is a basal eukaryote property, so there must be something else to it. Um, so let's first of all look at the effect of balancing selection. 
an easy one to think about. We have two alleles uh, at a particular site which have been maintained for a very long time in the population by some form of, say, heterozygote advantage or frequency-dependent selection. So you can think of these two alleles as defining two separate populations. So if we have a locus in the genome, let's say B, with another allele, little b, these two have been around for a long time in the population. If there's no crossing over going on in the neighborhood of those two alleles, we really have two separate populations, right? If there's a little bit of crossing over, those two populations can be connected from time to time by recombination events, maybe some other locus, and so C2 can get switched over, uh, and we get C2 and C1 instead. Um, as a result of recombination. So that's like migration between these two subpopulations. So, so if they're separated for a long time, at linked sites, neutral mutations can accumulate. So you can get C1 on the background of big B and C2 on the background of little b as a result of random genetic events. Uh, and there's only get a little bit of mixing uh, by recombination if those two sites are uh, closely linked. So here's a better cartoon of this. Here's our big B allele and our little b allele being maintained by selection. Uh, here we have a closely linked site with no recombination going on, A1, A1. Then a mutation will eventually occur and drift through the little b part of the population, so we get A2 and A1. So these two sites now are genetically different. This one can undergo crossing over. The mutation to C2 occurs, but it gets established in both populations, so we don't get much differentiation between them. So this is an intuitive um, explanation here. You can do the maths on this. This was done by Richard Hansen and Magnus Nordborg quite a long time ago. Um, and the prediction is that closely linked sites will tend to diverge purely by mutation and genetic drift, because they're maintained independent of each other. And once there's recombination, uh, you're going to get mixing, and they're going to behave much like the rest of the population. So the prediction is actually quite a lot of variability in this part of the chromosome compared with the rest of the genome. We've got A1 and A2. Uh, also associations with the selected sites here, not so much. What do we see? Uh, well, OK, summarize the prediction. Increase in nuclear, neutral nucleotide site diversity around the target selection, uh, and increased linkage to equilibrium in that region of the genome. Here's an example. This is the MHC, the major histocompatibility locus of loci of humans. Great uh, practical importance in blood transfusion and that kind of stuff. Um, not blood transfusion, tissue transplantation. Um, uh, highly polymorphic loci, uh, HLA and A and HLAB are the two loci in this part of the genome. Uh, they're well known to have lots of protein sequence variants. And if you look at neutral variation, this is blue line is for chimps, the red line is for humans. You see great peaks in genetic diversity at loci which have uh, introns and stuff like that, which have no uh, function that we're aware of and have nothing to do with the HLA genes themselves. They're in totally different bits of DNA. But you see these nice peaks of variability associated with these targets of long-term balancing selection. So this, in fact, is a tool for looking for long-term balancing selection. You can go across the genome and you can look at peaks of, of variability uh, which stand out from the background, and that's a candidate for the operation of balancing selection. Haven't, people haven't found very many of them, to be honest. There's maybe a, a few dozen examples across the whole human genome. Okay, so that's one effect of selection at linked sites. It, if you have balancing selection, you can maintain much more variation at purely neutral sites associated with that target. Then we get selective sweep. Well, these have been mentioned already by, by Lindy. Favorable mutation spreads to a high frequency or even fixation. And if it arises in a unique haplotype, 
But in the absence of a combination, it will drag the variants which happen to be present in that haplotype with it, right? A new mutation arises, rises as a unique event. There'll be some particular constellation of neutral variants or even selected variants on the same haplotype. It, they'll go for a ride with it. It's also called hitchhiking. Uh, in fact, that was the original term introduced by Maynard Smith and Haig uh, back in 1974. Here's a cartoon of that. We haven't got time to do the nice maths here. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. Um, but we can have a look intuitively at what's going on. So let's suppose we have two neutral variants. And they're going to be A and C here. B is our selected locus again, uh, each of which is present at 50-50 frequencies. And we have no LD initially. Then at this locus, a big B mutation arises on this particular genetic background. And then it spreads. And let's suppose it is also subject to some balancing selection. So it doesn't go to fixation. It spreads to a frequency of 0.6. Okay. So we've got, and there's no recombination. Things happen very quickly, or this is a region of the genome without any hotspots. So we have complete association. Big B is completely associated with A2 and C1. Okay, so that's giving us linkage to C equilibrium right off the bat. Um, the frequencies, relative frequencies of the alleles at the two loci, of course, in the rest of the population are unaffected. So we still have one to one to one to one ratio of these four gametes. So this is the final composition of the population. And this actually creates negative linkage to equilibrium between A2 and C1. Clear? So one type of selective sweep is a partial sweep in which something spreads to a high frequency and then stops. That will give us locally high linkage to equilibrium. And in fact, there's some reduction in diversity, especially within the selected haplotype, you can see that the big B has no diversity associated with it until some mutations come in, whereas the little b has lots of diversity. So we stick it a haplotype. Right. This was the hemoglobin locus. When you look at the individuals in this sample, 22 of those haplotypes, somewhere down the chromosome, carry the sickle cell mutation. So sickle cell, HBS, is not an example of long-term balancing selection. It's something which has come into the population relatively recently, probably about 10,000 years ago, association with the spread of malaria, uh, and hasn't gone to fixation for reasons we've already discussed. And you have an absolutely clear signature of a partial selective sweep here. What's more, you can look in different populations at variants carrying HPS, and you find different haplotypes. Not this one, but something else which is associated with the HPS. And that's telling you those are independently arising mutations. OK, so you can also get fixation. Bingo all the way to fixation. Bingo. Uh, you completely lose variation in the absence of recombination. But as you move away from that, Along the chromosome, frequency recombination uh, increases, so you can break down the associations, and you don't lose so much variability. So usually, in a decent sexually reproducing organism, unlike these disgusting bacteria, which are asexual, a selective sweep doesn't completely wipe out variability. Uh, it only wipes out variability in the region close to the target of selection. And you can calculate that effect as well. It's a nice. Uh, juicy bit of, of, of algebra, uh, except a couple of years ago, Nick Barton and Daniel Weissman came up with a two-line derivation of something which in the textbook occupies a whole, a whole um, box. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so here's a cartoon of a selective sweep. This is the initial population. These are neutral or weakly selected variants. Here's our favorable mutation. It spreads through the population, and that's all you've got left. No variation until mutation starts to come in. 
And here's a real-life example of this. This is the malaria parasite itself, uh, worked by Tim Anderson, this group in Texas. Uh, where we know that at this point in the chromosome, there's a drug resistance uh, gene right here. This is variability at microsatellite loci around the target of selection, and that actually fits the theoretical prediction extremely well. So again, you can use these predictions of population genetics theories to go out and scan the genome and look for sounds of selected streets, and that's got a major industry in human genetics. There are lots of problems, of course. Picking up the noise from the signal is a major difficulty. OK. Then there's another form of hitchhiking, which is associated with the removal of harmful mutations from the population. And let's again look at a non-recombining population. If we have a strongly deleterious mutations present in the population, they will be removed from the population with probability near one. So if you have, uh, if you're unfortunate enough to be a neutral variant that arises on the same haplotype as one of these deleterious mutations, you will, as they used to say in Chicago, be taken for a ride and eliminated from the population in association with that deleterious variant. Um, and of course, this is going on all the time. We're constantly producing deleterious alleles by mutation. And so, although the effect of any one of these sort of inverse hitchhiking events or selective sweeps is quite small, there's a lot of deleterious mutations coming in the population of regeneration, as Mike mentioned yesterday. So in the absence of recombination, uh, I haven't got time to go into the details again. You can actually show that the effective size of the population in the absence of recombination is reduced basically by a factor of e to the minus the ratio of the mutation rate to the selection coefficient against the mutations. Uh, so, and F0 is the equilibrium frequency of haplotypes that are free of deleterious mutations. In this somewhat extreme situation, uh, and you can relax some of these assumptions, in this extreme situation, your only chance of surviving in the population is if you are arise uh, as a new uh, neutron variant in something which is completely free of deleterious mutations. And that effectively drives down the effective population size by the fraction of the population which is mutation free. And that can be a major effect in a large non recombining genome. So here's a cartoon of that. Here we have start with 10 different sequences. These are the black dots here are neutral ones. Here are some deleterious mutations. After a certain time, each of these ones is wiped out of the population. So we reduce the number of different haplotypes to seven. So we reduce the amount of variability. This also means that the effectiveness of selection is going to be reduced when recombination rates are low by either selective sweeps or background selection. We can think of both of these as reducing uh, the effective population size. In the case of a selective sweep, you actually reduce it right down to one haplotype. You can't go lower than that. In the case of background selection, it's not quite such a marked effect. Um, so very, very crudely, uh, uh, this is not at all exact, uh, but it gives you some intuitive insight. We can think of low recombination regions genome or asexual organisms or highly self-fertilizing organisms. If you have high rates of self-fertilization, as Deborah mentioned yesterday, everybody's homozygous, so you have no opportunity for, for effective recombination. Uh, so in all of these situations, there's effectively low recombination, and this reduces the efficiency of selection. Uh, as I think uh, Lindy or Mike discussed yesterday, I didn't have time to go into it in my lecture. It should have been lecture two anyway. Uh, basically, if you have a finite population size of size NE, the whether or not selection is effective is really determined, again, by the product of NE and the absolute value of the selection coefficient. So if you pull down NE, you effectively reduce the intensity of selection for a given strength of selection. So a deleterious mutation with a given selection coefficient would be more likely to be fixed when NE is low, and favorable mutations will be less likely to be fixed. This is often called Hill-Robertson interference. It's sort of a generic term for selective sweeps, background selection, and a few other things. 
all of which involve selection at one locus, interfering with what's going on elsewhere in the absence of recombination. Okay? So you can think of recombination, in fact, as a way of getting out of this. It reduces the amount of interference between selective events going on in different parts of the genome. Everybody happy with that? So Hill, in fact, is my colleague at the University of Edinburgh. He's still going at the age of 74. This was his PhD work, published in 1966. So not everybody's PhD is a load of rubbish. Mine was, for sure, but, and most people's are. But this one is probably very one of the most highly cited PhD theses in genetics. Um, Robertson was his advisor, unfortunately no longer with us. So uh, this is the last bit. We're almost there. This is all theory, right? Except for a few examples. Um, can, we, uh, can we ask the question, of, you know, do we have evidence that this is important? And yes, we do. Um, if we look at studies of molecular evolution and variation, we do see clear signals of reduced variability and reduced levels of adaptation in regions of the genome where there's low levels of recombination or, or in organisms which have low levels of recombination. As Deborah mentioned yesterday, self-fertilizing plants show extraordinarily low levels of genetic diversity. In fact, more than you can account for by simple reduction in affected population size. Um, so I'm going to concentrate on work which we've been doing in Drosophila to illustrate some of these points. First of all, Drosophila is very nice because the rate of recombination uh, varies uh, across the genome in, in quite an interesting way. Uh, let's take, for example, the left arm of the second chromosome of Drosophila melanogaster. This is the, uh, the tip of the chromosome. You can see recombination is, and this is the base of the chromosome near the centromere. As we go along, the rate of recombination per megabase of DNA, so we're standardizing the rate at which crossing over is taking place by measuring it in units per megabase in this case. Um, but you can use whatever unit you like. So a high value here in the middle shows there's a lot of crossing over going on. There's rather little going on here. And when we get to this part of the chromosome, as far as classical genetic experiments are concerned, there's no crossing over. And similar patterns in other chromosomes. Um, so there's extensive variation, that's the bottom line here, across the Drosophila genome in the rate of crossing over that's going on, including some bits of the genome down here, which look as though they're essentially asexual. They don't have any crossing over. Uh, there's some whole chromosome, in fact, called the dot chromosome, which is one of the, uh, didn't show you on that slide, it has no crossing over at all. It's very small. Uh, it has about 80 genes. And here, here's a salivary gland chromosome picture of the top chromosome. And when we look at the fourth chromosome, there's been surveys of DNA sequence variation in about half a dozen different species of Drosophila, including some work in my lab. And you find that the DNA sequence variability on the fourth chromosome uh, is about 10% of the genome-wide average. So it's way, way down. And because we're looking at different species, we've got replication here, and it's, it's pretty consistent across different species. Surprising how consistent, actually. Usually in biology, consistency in experiments is hard to get, but this seems to be consistent. So low variation is associated with low recombination. There's also part of the genome called the heterochromatin, which is a sort of genetic garbage dump uh, for the most part closely associated with the centromeric regions of the chromosomes. Classically, this is thought not to have any genes in it, but it turns out when you do careful sequencing, there's about 200 to 400 genes hidden in this very highly repeated DNA inside the uh, heterochromatin. Part of the fourth chromosome I was talking about is not heterochromatic, but a lot of it is. Uh, so the black here is the non-heterochromatic part of the fourth chromosome. So very kindly, um, the DNA sequencing boys have turned up a large number of genes which are uh, inside the heterochromatin, and classically, that is thought to completely lack crossing over. So we've got another asexual bit of the genome. Okay, so what do we see? Well, first of all, we can correlate 
you can ask, is there a correlation between recombination rate and level of genetic diversity across the uh, Drosophila genome using those, those similar to those genetic maps I showed you earlier? Uh, this was uh, earlier work by David Presgrave, building on a previous paper, but classic paper by Bagan and Aquadro, pu published in 1992. And this is again is one of the few replicable observations in population genetics. In Drosophila, at least, the rate of level of variability is highly correlated with the local recombination rate. There's a lot of noise. And in fact, if you do statistics, recombination rate is the best statistical predictor of how much variability you'll see in a gene. Hello. Uh, it's measured by um, geneticists sitting in the lab doing crosses, measuring the recombination frequency. Then you know the position of the chromosome. Now, because the genome project, you know the position of the gene on the chromosome where you've measured the crossing over. And so you can ask, how much crossing over is there in that region of the genome? So it's rate of crossing over per megabase of DNA. So, so we're measuring the amount of recombination ag against the size of the chunk of genome. So to standardize things, right, good question. This is actually uh, not per megabase. It's 10 to the minus 5 base pairs per generation. Doesn't really matter. <laughs> more recombination, more variability. Uh, OK, what about adaptation? Um, do we see any evidence for differences in rates of sequence divergence? We might think uh, that if we look at non-synonymous mutations, that most of them are probably somewhat deleterious. There's plenty of evidence for that. Uh, if selection is less important in, or less effective in low recombination regions of the genome, we might expect to see a higher rate of amino acid sequence evolution because genetic drift will be fixing slightly deleterious mutations more frequently in those regions of the genome. I can see Deborah glaring at me, but I'm almost finished, actually, believe it or not. So we can measure that. This is, we talked about this already. And we can measure non-synonymous divergence between two species, in this case, Melanogaster and a relative Yacuba. K sub A is a standard measure of the fraction of non-synonymous sites that differ per site. KS is the value for synonymous sites. The bottom line is N sub zero here is the non-recombining, non-fourth chromosome genes. Uh, N sub four is the fourth chromosome. And here's the X chromosome. These are the recombining regions of the genome for the autosomes and the X. Actually, slightly higher KA for the X on the autosome. It's interesting, but not relevant to this. But you can see the non-crossover regions of the genome uh, show accelerated rates of protein sequence evolution. And that's uh, largely driven, uh, not driven by mutation. The KS values actually uh, are slightly up in the non-recombining regions of the genome, but KA over KS is also up. So uh, we're, we're we're pretty sure that there's evidence for accelerated protein sequence evolution in these non-recombining parts of the Drosophila genome. So that's consistent with the idea that selection is less effective at screening out deleterious amino acid variants in this region of the genome. Of course, it's possible uh, that it could be the other way around. There's more adaptive evolution going on in these parts of the genome. This goes against all the principles of population genetics. Uh, but of course, uh, it is possible for population geneticists to be wrong. So we need to check into that. You can do that by looking at polymorphism. Uh, this is a paper we've got in press in Molecular Biology and Evolution. It is now freely available on the website of Molecular Biology and Evolution. Uh, we took data which was generated by John Poole and his colleagues uh, the, called the Drosophila Population Genomics Project, where they've taken samples from all over Africa and also from France. Um, and we've looked at 17 good uh, sequences of haploid genomes from an African population. We use Africa because, as for humans, that's the center of origin of Drosophila melanogaster. So Drosophila melanogaster basically followed humans out of Africa. Um, so you need to go to Africa uh, to study what you think of as undisturbed populations. They're not, actually, uh, unfortunately. 
So, I, what I'm going to tell you without going into the details is that various indicators from the polymorphism data, the strength of selection against deleterious non-synonymous mutations, show that this increases with the frequency of recombination experienced by a gene. I haven't got time to go into the details. You'd have to read the papers itself. So there's a, a massive a piece of computational machinery which was invented by Adam A. Walker and Peter Keatley called DFE Alpha. And you can feed your data into this machinery and it will spit out some numbers. I'm not going to explain how it does this, except basically it's comparing the frequency distribution of variants at synonymous sites, which are assumed to be neutral, with the frequency distribution at non-synonymous sites, which are assumed to be primarily under purifying selection. And then you can estimate the product of effective population size and selection coefficient, that's NES. And you can ask what proportion of uh, new mutations you can, uh, it's supposed to infer, um, and I sometimes wonder whether it really does, but that's an, another issue, the proportion of new mutations, so this is new mutations, not the ones which are present in the population, we're going right back to the mutational process, proportion of new mutations which have selection, any S values between 0 and 1. In other words, they're in the sort of zone where they're sort of nearly neutral. The rest of the distribution is above that, any S is greater than 1, and those are the ones which are fairly effectively under the control of selection. So what we did, you have to work with bins. We made bins of 10 recombination rates for the autosomes and 6 for the X chromosome, so we have less data for the X, and plot this measure of the fraction of non-synonymous mutations which are nearly neutral against the recombination rate for those bins. And you get a pretty impressive negative relationship. So with more recombination, we have fewer and fewer non-synonymous mutations which are falling into this nearly neutral class. We have some other measures which are actually more robust and don't don't require so much statistical massaging, and it gives pretty much the same result. So, and this black dot here is for the non-recombining portion of the genome, and you can see that's, that's way up. We've pulled uh, all five non-recombining regions of the Drosophila genome into one dot here, because they're individual ones and noisy and don't look very nice, to be honest. Uh, so this is the average. So more recombination, more effective elimination of deleterious mutations. That's almost done. Do the same using DFE alpha. It also spits out some magic numbers. Um, gives us how many amino acids are fixed by positive selection. That's why it's called alpha. So if we compare our two sequences, by comparing polymorphism and divergence, we can ask what proportion of amino acid differences between the two species are caused by positive selection. It's that recombination removes interference between low mutations that are subject to selection. Uh, this increases genetic diversity at neutral sites uh, and allows more rapid evolution, uh, adaptive evolution, and more effective elimination of deleterious mutations. So the the bottom line, then, is sex is actually a good thing. It helps populations, stops populations from going down the toilet. And Deborah will, um, in one sense, and make them evolve better in another sense. Deborah will be talking more about this in her lecture. OK, thank you. That's it. It's over. Uh, any questions? Yes. It's well. It's a good. It's a. It's a. It's a, a very large question. Uh, what? What do we need to promote the evolution of non-zero recombination? Um, to be honest, we don't know the answer to that question for sure. But it's very likely that these sort of processes. Uh, whereby recombination ameliorates 
uh, the effects of interference between selected sites is a major player in giving us an evolutionary advantage for recombination. Uh, the, and this presumably is enough to overcome the epistatic selection. So it is, as you say, it suggests that actually there isn't that much epistatic selection going on. Otherwise, our genomes would, as somebody once put it, our genomes would congeal and we just, just have totally non-linked flocks. So that's a good question. Anyway, I think it's time for coffee and anybody who wants more questions.